I'm Brian Dell, host of Drive Time on WBGO, World Class Jazz Radio for the world's greatest city, of which Champion Fulton is a part. She's been in New York City for about 20 years now, but as she joins me today, she is actually doing what she does so very often, globe trotting. <laughs> At this very moment, Champion is joining me from lovely Spain. Barcelona is where she is preparing for a show, I believe, tomorrow night mm -hmm. uh, in Barcelona. Champion Fulton, welcome to the WBGO studios. Hi, Brian. Nice to see you. Thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. And this uh, performance that you're doing in Spain mm -hmm. is just one performance out of so very many. Right now you're on tour in Europe for how long? About a month? It's about a month. Um, and I actually, so I started the tour in Canada actually on February 10th. And I was in Canada for about, I was like two weeks, 10 days. Uh, and then I've been in Europe since February 23rd. And I will be here until March 26th. And we're talking about not just Spain and Italy and France, but you're really going all over. You've been in Graz, mm -hmm. Austria. You have been in Germany. You're going to Denmark. Mm -hmm. What is that like for uh, a woman who was born and raised in Norman, Oklahoma, <laughs> less than 10 miles, by the way, from where I was raised? Uh, how, what is that like to be touring the world these days? I love it so much. I just, I enjoy all of it. Even, uh, you know, the other day we had a 10 hour car ride hmm. and, um, but that was, it's fine. I mean, it was beautiful. We drove through the, uh, through the Alps, we drove through the mountains. I just really love the opportunity to travel and play and meet people and see things. And, uh, you know, a rolling stone gathers no moss. So, <laughs> <laughs> but it does manage to swing. Which yes. you always do, by the way, every so. single time that you sit down at the piano. I know I'm going to hear some incredible swing. And I'm sure that the audiences in Europe probably feel the same. How have, how have you found the audiences on this current tour? Well, it's been really great. You know, I mean, this is uh, almost a little more than 10 years since I've been coming to Europe. And I come usually every spring and then in the summer and then sometimes in the fall. And... It's, I've, I think I've developed a really nice rapport with the audiences here and we see full houses and very warm people. And uh, I, I just really love getting to see the same people over and over again every year too. They, they follow me and I love that. And you keep up with all of this very much on your Facebook page uh, and mm -hmm. your other social media. How important is that to uh, young artists these days? I mean, I think it's really important. It's very important to me um, because I love to share what I'm doing with people and I love to talk to them. You know, I spend a lot of every morning, uh, morning, when, you know, when I wake up, I spend a lot of time replying to messages and, and DMs and comments because um, I think the relationship and the community of the music is very important. So in other words, you're, real, you're really um, presenting yourself uh, not just as a, a performer mm -hmm. and an entertainer, but... Uh, a friend, uh, uh, you're developing a close relationship to the people who actually listen to you all the time. I think so. I hope so. You know, I mean, uh, you know, Louis Armstrong used to, he loved to respond to letters and write letters to people. And I, I learned about that from Clark Terry, who also loved to write letters and, and postcards and call people from the road. Of course, there was no social media, but he would stay in touch with people just old fashioned way. And uh, I don't know, I sort of just learned it from them. And I, I like to do it. And I think it's important. This is encouraging because I'm finding people your age, a lot of times I think that social media and uh, uh, cell phones, uh, smartphones mm -hmm. in particular, they tend to put distance between people. Mm, uh, yes. And I think that's probably one of the major drawbacks of that particular form of communication that has become so ubiquitous mm -hmm. for almost everyone on the planet. But here you are building relationships by using this technology and in a very positive way. Well, I think it's because it's, I think of it as a tool, uh, like a letter or a postcard or the, the phone. And personally, I like to talk on the phone as well. So I tell people we can, you know, if we're doing business or anything, like we can talk on the phone and get it done as opposed to email and email and text and text. Let's just do it, you know. <laughs> I like communicating and staying in touch. So I think I, I like to use all the different technology available for that. I think that's a, a very healthy attitude. And... <laughs> Uh, and I hope that 
you know, some people will adopt that even more. I actually saw, ironically, mm-hmm. on your Facebook page, I saw a posting that you did about talking on the phone some months ago. <laughs> how you wish that how you wish that people would just pick up the phone and chat for five or ten minutes. That's the you know that, that that connection seems to be so much more important. People don't like to talk on the phone anymore. I remember when I moved to New York. Uh, and I met Frank West like the first week I moved here or to New York. And, um, you know, Frank, I asked for Frank's number and I said, can I call, you know, can I call you sometime? He was like, yeah, call me. And so after I started calling him, he would call me sometimes every other day, check in. How are you doing? How's school? What's going on? Are you coming to town? You know, we would talk for five minutes, but it was it was part of his day that he liked to kind of call his friends regularly. And I like that, too. One of our great joys was running into uh, Frank West and his wife wherever we seemed to go. It seems yeah. like, and they and they were. It wasn't that he was playing; he was just mm-hmm. hanging. They were just hanging. And Frank loved the to music. hang. He, he would did. go see shows, and he loved to go out to dinner. Like he loved to go, and he loved to go just to gigs. He would go to people's like little gigs, and so I, I loved that too. Well, uh, let's move on then to your new album, mm-hmm. which even though you're right now currently jet setting and trotting around the globe and swinging all over the place, uh, your new album was actually captured live at what I guess is your home base really more than anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's reflected simply by its title, meet me at Birdland, mm-hmm. which is where you and I have met most often, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> Birdland has been my, as you said, my home base in New York for a really long time. Um, I got my very first gig there in 2003. Um, I played happy hour piano for the club for Johnny on Thursdays, I think from six to eight or eight 30, depending because the main show started used to start at eight 45. Um, and then after I did that for a few years, I started singing there with David Berger. And back then they were called the Sultans of swing. And we did every Tuesday, uh, which culminated in my first recording, my first professional record. And ever since then, I've just stayed, I've stayed at working at Birdland, doing Sundays, doing here and there. And then um, in 2020, I did my very first week. Uh, and then I thought, wow, why don't we make a live record here? Um, you know, like Clifford Brown and Lou Donaldson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which is what I wanted to do. So. <laughs> oh, but uh, we should say, was this before or after the pandemic began in 2020? Well, I did um, in 2020. I don't know if you remember in December of 2020, New York reopened at 25%, I think, for about five days. And very randomly, I had gotten those days at Birdland. And so we played that those days that the club was open and it was it was great. And then, you know, we talked and Johnny said, why don't you do Christmas of 21? I said, great. Uh, and then in 22, we we were booked for two different weeks, one in September and one in December. And I just, the idea sort of started culminating, I guess, in the year of 21 and fleshed out last year. So the result here is her new album, yes. Meet Me at Birdland, which is coming out on April 7th, just a few days actually from where we are right now. And you will be returning to Birdland to celebrate that. But I'm fascinated by the set. I was just listening to it. And the fact that you did four nights at Birdland last September, you mm-hmm. never repeated a single song. That's what they say. I don't really remember. <laughs> <laughs> we don't. Um, we have it. So it's with my trio, I should say, with Fukushi Tainaka on drums and Hide Tanaka on bass. And we have been working together since about 04 or 05. That's a, that's a very long stretch, especially for someone uh, mm-hmm. at, the, at your age to, uh, to yeah. be with the same trio for almost two decades. What well, is we, that like? We, you know, I have some, I have obviously I have other recordings with other rhythm sections, uh, David Williams and Lewis Nash. And, and um, I did work with some other bands off and on, but Fuku and Hide and I, I think are always drawn back to each other because we have a, a real rapport and we love, uh, we have the sort of same musical ideas or values, I think. And uh, we really love playing together. And so we have a large repertoire at this point, many years of <laughs> yeah. different things. This is the um, reason you could do four nights and not repeat a single song. Yes. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think so. And I think the guys, um, they're so creative also. Like they're really, it's, it's a very fun trio I find because 
sometimes when you play, you know, it's like I play piano and I sing and then the bass and drums are like accompaniment or they, they're following me all the time. But Hide and Fuku, where someone is always leading and it's not always me. And I love that. A good example of that on the new album, uh, I find, is your original composition, Happy Camper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> which I, I, I immediately was snared by it because, for one thing, it swings, which is always welcome to me. Uh, for another thing, it 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 evoked a exactly what the title says. It, <laughs> it's a happy sounding tune, mm -hmm. but then you also have another instrumental feature mm -hmm. on the album that's a good nine minutes long, and it's called "I Don't Care." Yeah. <laughs> Where does that come from? So that's a, a blues written by Ray Bryant, um, the great jazz pianist, and I used to hear Junior Mance play that tune all the time. I was good friends with Junior. I saw him many times in New York and, uh, you know, we hung out a lot and he used to play that tune. And it, I love, it's a minor blues and I love the blues and I love minor blues. And uh, the past couple of years, I've just been getting into that tune. And yeah, it's, it's not, it's like nine minutes and something. And people were like, are you going to put that on the record? It's very long. And I said, yeah, I'm going to put it on the record. <laughs> unedited let's just put it on there <laughs> <laughs> well it's a live performance after all yeah. you know yeah, I, I want it to be like a real um to me you know i, I was gonna say a real jazz record because sometimes jazz records have long tunes that's the that's, that's the whole idea ever since the invention of you know lps 33 right. and a third it's like you, you just go for it do, yeah. do what you so, want especially on a live date like this one and I think uh, particularly Hide, he has a great bass solo on on I Don't Care. Yes, he certainly does. Yeah. The interplay uh, brings to mind that you have with Fukushi and, and Hide. It really brings to mind, and I, and I only cite her because she's another fabulous player, uh, but Marion McPartland, one of the mm -hmm. original women of jazz, mm -hmm. 70 years ago was doing work like this with bassists like Bill Crow and mm -hmm. drummers like Joe Morello, they played at the Hickory house yeah. on 52nd street for years. Do you foresee something like this for yourself? Well, I hope so. I think, I think um, it's important to have I, I, longevity, of course, in the music and especially with, with an ensemble. I think if you, if you stay with the same people in your band, uh, you grow and you learn together and you develop together and, um, and I think if you're always changing ensembles or if you don't have a band or the concept of a band, it's hard to, to grow. But in this case, mm -hmm. you have played with those two musicians for so many years, and yet you're playing with different musicians, for instance, at the uh, date that you have tomorrow night in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. Now, are you employing that same rhythm section on your entire European tour, or do you actually employ different bassists and drummers depending upon where you are. It is uh, different depending where I am. What I like to do is keep a rhythm section for at least a couple weeks. Um, so we travel maybe, you know, I just did Italy and Germany and, and Austria, and that was the same rhythm section the whole time. And then in Spain, it'll be the same rhythm section. And in France and actually in Brussels, it'll be the same rhythm section. Um, because I think it's, it's nice to have different it, it, still the concept of the band, even if we don't play together all the time, like the guys know the tunes I like to play. I know the tunes they like to play and, and we have a repertoire. So I do like to have bands. By the same token, mm. uh, when you do get into a trio situation like that for two weeks, do you find that it's easy to find the groove every night when you get on the bandstand? It should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say, you know, mostly I, that's the idea, of course, you know, and but, it, you know, when you're on the road and you're playing so often, every day is a little bit different because um, you're tired or you don't have a good sound check or the guys are arguing about something stupid or whatever. Um, but I think when you when you hit the stage, yeah, it should be boom. Well, let's talk about uh, what the last 20 years have been like. This is Women's History Month, after all. Mm -hmm. And uh, you represent the coming generation, future history, I think, of this music. What has it been like coming up for you over the last two decades? And mm -hmm. have the last five to six, seven years made a huge difference? Because we do see the scene changing. Yeah, for sure. The scene is changing a lot. Um, 
I can't believe that I've been in New York for 20 years. <laughs> it's shocking. To I me. know. Time flies, doesn't it? Very fast. Um, I, I felt very lucky because I feel like when I moved to New York, I was able to make really good friendships and relationships with some of the you know, jazz legends and heroes uh, of ours that have, that have passed, have yes, since indeed. passed away. And not, not everybody. Of course, I'm still really good friends with Lou Donaldson. He's just turned 96. And so I feel like I was able to learn a lot and be a part of that community, which is so fortunate um, for me. And it was my dream. That's why I came to New York, you know, from Oklahoma. That's what I wanted to do. And um I loved that. And I love, I love being a part of that. And now the past five, six years have been great because I, I feel like I'm starting to, uh, not starting to, but I mean, I'm working more, I'm traveling more, I'm achieving those things that I wanted to achieve. So I, I feel, I feel pretty good about everything, I guess. Do you find it's different for a, a woman, a young woman like yourself uh, now than it was when you came to New York or even, different from uh it was five six years ago i don't know i think it's because i've been on the scene so long things are different to me just because i've been around for a long time and i know everybody um it's a man's business still i think um i think it, maybe it's changing um but I was lucky. I, as I said, when I came, that older generation, like we mentioned Frank West, we mentioned Lou Donaldson, Jimmy Cobb, Louis Hayes, those guys were super cool to me. Never anything st strange or, uh, you know, I didn't feel that they treated me differently necessarily because I was a girl. Um, they were just, they treated me, I thought, like a musician. And that I think gave me a lot of confidence and sort of protected me almost like within the scene well it's always the the theory i've always had and mm -hmm. i've been here a little bit longer than you but i've also been you know putting this music on the air since before you were born and the way i've always felt about it is that the swing really doesn't depend upon your gender no you can either do it or you can't yeah. <laughs> you know maybe if, if you've got that thing in your left hand like you do. And the very first time my wife and I saw you, by the way, probably at Birdland, mm -hmm. uh, I leaned over to her and I said, her right hand's hers, but her left hand belongs to Errol Garner. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> or Earl Father Hines. I can't remember. It was that kind of <laughs> night. But, the you know, it really does. You can it, Jazz is the kind of music that you can either play or you can't. Yeah. And it really doesn't, it really doesn't matter, you know, your gender or your age. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you've got it, you've got it. And if you don't, well, probably find something else to do for a living. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And I, I think that's, that's really what it comes down to. Like you're a part of the community or, or, you know, the community of musicians or, or you're not. Well, when you do come home and I don't know when that is, I think you're, you're due home when uh, next month sometime. I come home for a few days on March 26th, but then actually I go to Chicago and then I go to Denmark. So <laughs> when you do come home, we'll welcome you back uh, to the jazz corner of the world. You know, the greatest place in the world for music. And that's at Birdland. Champion Fulton, you can meet at Birdland in May. Mm -hmm. May 28th. We will be there Sunday, May 28th. And we'll look forward to having you back, Champion. Thanks for spending time with us today. Yeah. Thank you, Brian. Mm -hmm.